Obadiah. We're going into um, Obadiah today. Um, before we get there, though, I wanted to make an announcement because we have turned into, of course, the Roman year, the beginning of the new Roman year. But this is a great opportunity for us to plan. So after Shabbat, please go along to Milk and Punny and um, check out the new calendars. We've got the Hebrew calendars for the year so you can make a date for the feasts, the Moedim, and um, you can check that out on our website. Um, of course, that's a blessing that uh, Milk and Punny from our congregation have produced that, and I think it's a beautiful calendar that was shot in Israel and is in line with the Book of the Covenant calendar here at the ministry. So please take advantage of that so that you can come visit us for the feasts and plan and prep. So Praise Yah for that. I'm excited to have a wall calendar and know what's going on. I have to keep looking at my phone all the time. Obadiah, Obadiah, I entitled this week's teaching The Edomite Sephardic Ashkenazi Confederacy over Biblical Israel and the Fight for Dominance because I like a nice long title. Can we put any more words into it? But in all seriousness, I knew that I'd have a couple of weeks to do a topical teaching. And I was, I was praying and seeking the Father because I wanted to speak a little bit to you about current events. But you know me, I didn't want to just do that without a biblical platform from which to do it. I thought, so I was seeking the Father, and I truly wanted to be able to talk about some current events, some things that I'm seeing in the nation, in the nations. And I wanted the Father to show me how I could do that through the Word so that we could always filter everything through the Scriptures. That's just the way I like to teach, and I pray that Yahuwah can do that through me today. Because I hope you're paying attention I hope you're paying attention firstly to Yahuwah and His Word, but the Ruach HaKodesh giving you the insight and the discernment as you walk around on this planet Earth. Okay, because there are things that are going on right in front of our face if you've got the eyes to see. But we live in a world of distraction and sensationalism. Obadiah specifically, specifically is the answer to my prayer for a biblical platform for what I want to talk to you about in current events. And it was amazing when the Holy Spirit showed me Obadiah deals with a confederacy exposing confederacies and alliances. Have you noticed that right now in the world, whether it's the princes in Saudi Arabia, whether it's the Europeans and Brexit in Britain, whether it's the FBI director in America, whether it's all of that going on in Hollywood, that there is something going on. It's not limited to the United States of America. It's happening with the Saudis. It's happening in Israel. The former prime minister of Israel is in prison. The next prime minister, the current prime minister, they're in investigating. These people that have made confederacies, excuse me, with one another, they have made alliances with one another. What is happening? These alliances and confederacies are being exposed and people are being taken down. Because what's happening is there is a huge awakening. It's almost like a reformation. There is a huge awakening in the consciousness, the global consciousness, to the corruption and the alliances and confederacies. And there is no other book in Scripture that shows us exactly what's going on than the book of Obadiah. 
And I think that this is so important for us to have the eyes to see so that we can literally see what's going on in the world through the eyes of the prophet. Because like um, Jeremiah, like Daniel specifically, Obadiah, who was in that time of Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel, you see a multi-level prophecy. Meaning we're going to be dealing with really a time when the Babylonians came against Jerusalem. That's the first level. The second level is when the Romans came against Jerusalem. And then you're going to see the final stage, which is when the flame, Joseph returns because the confederacies and the alliances are being cracked and exposed. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself because I'm already starting to kind of get worked up because you have to understand this is where my head, my heart, and the spirit has been put me the past couple of weeks. And I've been somewhat obsessing. So I literally have laid it aside for the past four days because I needed to, to kind of, I got to can't. But I'm excited because I always say this, but it's so true. The Bible is alive. In the real world, people are asleep, and then you go to the Word. Oh, my goodness, it's right before your very eyes. So my title, again, makes sense to me. I pray it makes sense to you. The Edomite, Sephardic, Ashkenazi Confederacy over Biblical Israel and the fight for dominance. So there. All right. Esau. Let's look at Esau. Esau. From Esau, we get the Edomites. From the Edomites, of course, we get Edom, connecting to the children of Lot. Well, you know that's not good, don't you? And from the children of Lot, we're looking at the geographical region of Jordan. And from there, we end up with the Amalekites, the people that attacked the Israelites when they first came out of Egypt. And today, we've got the Jordanians. So again, this conspiracy and the line of ascent from Esau, that line we're going to see come over into our scriptures. Of course, let's start with Obadiah in the Hebrew, Obadiah from Ebed, servant of Yah. Of course, this is a prophecy about judgment and promise. And the judgment focuses on Edom. The question is, who is Edom? And there's many different ideas by theologians on who Edom is. I'm going to present to you who I believe Edom is based upon history, context, culture, and of course, most importantly, the scripture. But we're going to see that this judgment of Edom, who's dispossession and downfall is proclaimed. Why? Because Edom became arrogant because it was treacherous against Judah. Edom made alliances and confederacies with people that they thought would cover them and strengthen them and allow them to do what they want. And their treachery was against Judah. And so these alliances will eventually turn on their head and judgment will come upon them. This is the whole context of the book of Obadiah. Now, initially this happened during the siege and destruction of the first temple. But later, the destruction of the second temple and their alliance there with the Romans. So the first alliance was with the Babylonians. The second alliance was with the Romans. Today, the alliance is with the globalists and the New World Order. These alliances is the whole context of Obadiah and Yahweh by his spirit, will expose it and judge it. It's not going to be the work of man. So when you see these things happening around you, have faith. 
Don't have faith in men. Your politicians aren't going to expose it. No matter how great you think, or maybe you don't, that Donald Trump is or isn't, if these alliances are going to be exposed, it is the work of Yahweh through the Spirit in the world today because Yahweh is coming in to shift things because we just so happen to be in this prophetic third cycle, a wheel within a wheel within a wheel. First cycle, the Babylonian alliance, the Edomites. Second cycle, the Edomite alliance, Herod and the Romans. And now this third cycle, the Edomite alliance with the globalists. But it's going to be exposed. And it is not a work of man. It never has been. This is amazing. And I truly believe that Yahweh has a word for us today as we go through again. Obadiah was the only known convert from Edom to obtain the gift of prophecy. Obadiah was therefore very suitable, wasn't he? A suitable vehicle to condemn the descendants of Edom, considering he was a descendant of Edom, but he chose the righteous path, which means that, yes, Edom could have chosen the righteous path too, but they chose, of course, the broad way, not the narrow way. way, Excuse me. Obadiah does connect to the Torah. That's most probably where we should start and then come into the book of Obadiah. So with that in mind, Turn in your scriptures to Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 32, and we'll go from the beginning, lead into the book of Obadiah, and then bring it forward into today's current events. Thirty-two verse one, Genesis chapter thirty-two verse one. We have to understand that a lot of Christians and Messianics, Hebrew roots, whatever you want to call it, even Jews today, they get their eschatological worldview is shaped by their view of who is Israel, right? Who are the Jews? What's going on with Jerusalem? What about the temple? And a lot of this worldview comes from a misunderstanding of the book of Ezekiel, which is the next book that I'm going to be teaching. So we have to understand as we come into this that our worldview, if we're going to be people of the book, and we are not going to go with the status quo of religious deception. Our worldview has to be distinctly different when it comes to Israel, the Jews, the temple, Jerusalem, and the book of Ezekiel. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck with the same status quo for 2,000 years. And the spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, is calling his people because we are a narrow road people that questions the status quo. And we are calling that the scriptures tell us what to do, not the traditions of men. So with that, let's get prepared because to truly understand the book of Obadiah, we have to go back and understand the struggle of where it began in Genesis chapter 32. Because what we're going to see with Obadiah, it is a multi-layered prophecy addressing historical events after the division of the house of Israel. Remember the house of Israel was divided after King Solomon, was it not? We had the division of the house of Israel. This is the first level of prophecy, is that Obadiah is going to be addressing what happened after the division of the house of Israel, which of course happened with the Babylonians and the destruction of Jerusalem and the first temple. But it's also going to look at the prophetic middle ground which was between the division of the house of Israel and the sending out of Rachel and Joseph. And we're going to see this in our text. And the Edomites 
were then in the third round, we saw the Edomites had infiltrated Herod and the Herodians, correct, at the time of Yahushua. Their treachery, they again sided with the Romans against two classes of Jews, which we've covered before, those nomadic land farmers and the traveling regal merchant class of Jews. Both of them were betrayed and their identity was stolen by the Edomites. So the key thing that the Edomites do is they make an alliance, a confederacy, and they make that confederacy and then push out the Jews, and then they steal their identity, and that they hope that their alliance with their partners will cover them and keep them enshrouded. But the prophet Obadiah tells us that Yahweh is the one that will eventually bring a judgment and then a promise of hope to expose the confederacy and to expose those alliances. So, Genesis chapter 32. Think about the three prophetic realms of Obadiah. Number one, you've got the first temple after the division of the house of Israel. And number two, you've got the middle ground. The middle ground, which is the second temple's destruction. And then finally, you've got the Third, the prophetic presence, which is going to be the time of Joseph. Now, as we get into the text here, you're going to see that Jacob, who is Israel, and you're going to see that Jacob divides his house. The division of the house is regarding what? Right after that, the first temple. Then... He sends out drove upon drove upon drove. And the middle ground between the droves is the second temple's destruction with the Romans. And then finally, when he brings out Rachel and her son Joseph, that's the flame, that's the prophetic present. Do you understand where I'm, how I'm building this upon the Scripture? I haven't even got to the Scripture. Let's read it. And Jacob went out on his way, and the Malach of Yahuwah met him. The angel of Yahuwah met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is Elohim's camp, and he called the name of that place Two Camps. He divides his house. This happened with Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, Esau is Edom, his brother, to the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, So shall you speak to my master Esau. Your servant Jacob says thus, I have lived with Laban and stayed until now. And I have oxen and asses and flocks and men servants and slave women. And I have sent to tell my master that I may find grace in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, We came to your, your brother Esau and he comes to meet you with 400 men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the, divided the people with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two bands. This again now speaks of the division of the house of Israel, which happened after King Solomon. And he said, if Esau comes to the one company and strikes it, then the other company which is left shall escape. And Jacob said, O oh, Elohim of my father Abraham and Elohim of my father Isaac, Yahuwah, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have done to your servant. 
For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I have become two houses, or two bands, or two camps. Deliver me, verse 11, I pray you, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he come and strike me from mother to sons. You said, I will surely do you good and make your seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. And he lodged there that night, and he took of that which came to his hand a present for Esau, his brother, 200 she-goats, 20 he-goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milk camels, and their colts, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 she-asses, and 10 foals. And he delivered into the hands of his servants every drove by themselves. And he said to his servants, pass over in front of me and put a space between drove and drove. The space between the droves brings us into the second prophetic wheel, which is when the Edomites made an alliance with the Romans in the second temple period. Now, I've got some conversations going on in the back. Very hard for me to focus. So if you could please not talk in here. It's a small place, and I've got to focus, because otherwise there's no way I'm going to be able to get through the message. Please, thank you. If you have questions, please write them down. And we will try and address those afterwards. So now verse 17, we see after the droves, and he commanded the foremost saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you saying, to whom do you belong and where do you go? And whose are these before you? Then you shall say, your servant's Jacob's. It is a present sent from my master Esau. And behold, he also is behind us. So he commanded the second and the third and all that followed the droves, saying, In this way you shall indeed speak to Esau when you find him. Verse 20. And also you shall say, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face. You see, we have been in a situation for the past 40 years of appeasement. In the nations, we have been in this whole culture of appeasement. And now we are moving into a in a situation out of appeasement and you are seeing when you start to appease things then everything starts to what bubble and fester and spoil and eventually if you don't take action then Yahweh will come in and cause an adjudgment expose the alliances and the confederacies so that he can take things to the next level in prophecy and I believe that's where we're at today Because we have lived in a nation of appeasement for the past 40 years. And you cannot continue that way. You simply can't. Perhaps he will accept me, verse 21, and the present went over before him, and he himself lodged that night in the camp. Let's turn to chapter 33, verse 1. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came and 400 men with him. And he divided the children of Leah and came to Rachel and two of the handmaids. And he put the slave women and their children first, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph last. So again, this speaks of what? The multi-level prophecy that we're going to get into in the book of Obadiah. Not only did we have the division of the houses, which of course takes us to the first temple period after the division of the house of Israel. But then we have a space between droves. How many years? About 400 years. There was what? How many? 400. We have a space between droves 
which takes us to the second temple period and the alliance with the Romans. And then finally, we have the time of Joseph, Rachel's son Joseph, which brings us into the prophetic present. And you can see that even towards this division with the children right there in verse 2. You've got the slave women and their children first, Then you have got the second grouping, and finally you have your third grouping, our third wheel. Now go back to Obadiah chapter 1. I have to take my time. I know it's a little bit lengthy, but if we're going to do justice to the Scripture, but also understand where we're at today, I have to lay the foundation. So do excuse me. I know it's a little bit like, okay, what's he talking about? Is everybody with me? Okay, all right, good. The vision of Ovaja in the Hebrew, Obadiah. This says Yahuwah Elohim concerning Edom. We have heard a report from Yahuwah, and an ambassador is sent among the nations. Arise, and let us rise up against him in battle. Behold, I have made you small among the nations, and you are greatly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You that dwell in the clefts of the rock, those whose dwelling is high, says in his heart, who shall bring me down, down to the ground? Remember, Esau dwelt in Mount Seir. And Mount Seir is actually, it's kind of weird, Mount Seir, but it's actually in a valley. And that valley is called Araber. Now, Araber is the feminine for Arab. So what do we see here? Genesis chapter 36, verse 8, the feminine Araber for Arab. In the end times, Esau... The Edomites are going to make an alliance, and that alliance is going to use the Arabs as a tool to bring forth their agenda. It's not the Arabs, but the Arabs, they are deliberately using as a tool to progress their alliance along further into wickedness. So everybody's going to be looking at the Muslims. Everybody's going to be looking at the Arabs. Everything's terrorism, terrorism, terrorism. But in reality, the Edomite alliance wants you to be looking over here because they're using the Valley of Arabair to bring forth their wicked, wicked fruit. I hope you can understand where we're going here because we are going to see that Esau is going to use the valley, Arabair, the feminine for Arab, to bring about his own intent. He's going to use the Arabs as a tool to bring about his end time intent. So from Esau, we've got the Edomites, Edom, the children of Lot, southern Jordan, the Amalekites, and the Jordanians. Again, now that branches into really ethnic Middle Easterners because these ethnic Middle Easterners, Edom, they joined with the Babylonians. Later, they joined with the Romans to expel the Jews. First to Babylon, then they later aided the Romans in the expulsion of both classes of Jews, stole their identity, And these Edomites became who? No. These Edomites became the Sephardim, the Sephardic, which is in the latter verses of Obadiah. These Edomites, these native Middle Easterners, became and reinvented themselves as the Sephardic, and they stole the identity of the... Jews, the Jews, because they made alliances, firstly with the Babylonians, secondly with the Romans, they made an alliances, and they had the regal Negro house of Judah expelled down to the west coast of Africa, where they established the kingdom of Judah, 
And then the Fehalim, the poor working class Jews, were later caused through poverty to convert to Islam and become what's known as the Fehalim, the working farmer class. And then the Edomites became the Sephardic Jews. They stole their identity. And later, at the end of the 19th century, the Sephardic Jews made an alliance with who? Edom makes an alliance. The Sephardic Jews make an alliance with the Ashkenazi. And in the end times, that alliance is actually going to be turned on their head. And the Ashkenazi are going to make slaves, and have currently done, made slaves of the Sephardics. And the whole thing is going to come tumbling down. That's kind of a preemptive for you of where we're going, but we have to understand our history before we can get further into this. So, Edom will have their deeds, Edom, the Sephardic Jews, which really aren't Jews because they stole the identity of the Jews, because the real regal house of Judah was the royal Negro class that then got expelled and down to West Africa. And those that remained were, of course, the poor migrant class, which became the farmers and the workers that in the 7th century, they couldn't afford to keep their land because of the jihad's Islamic tax. They were forced to convert to Islam and became what we call today the Palestinians. So the Ashkenazi and the Sephardics have made an alliance and they have stolen the true identity of the Jews, which is, tells you from the book of Obadiah that this would happen. But Edom will have their deeds returned upon them by the Ashkenazi taking their identity and oppressing them, and it says, pushing them to the borders. Are they being pushed to the settlement borders today? Exactly, exactly. You can see that in verse 7. Look at verse 3. The clefts of the rock, the Hebrew word there, hagu, it means to be surrounded by walls. Because, of course, those walls would deter an invasion and it encourages complacency within. And the Ashkenazi have been very complacent. Verse 4. Though you exalt yourself as the eagle... And though you set your nest upon, up among the stars, even from there will I bring you down, says Yahuwah. Among the stars in verse 4, that's like a false sense of security as they set up camp with Lucifer. Because who's among the stars? Isaiah 14 tells us that it is Lucifer who's among the stars. And Edom has made an alliance and set up with Lucifer, the synagogue of Satan, those that have stolen the Jews' identity. They say they're Jews, but they are not. And they feel invincible as they've made this partnership with Sheol. Verse 5. If thieves come to you, if robbers by night, how cut off you'd be. Would they have not stolen until they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought for? All the men of your confederacy have brought you even to the border. They're pushing the Sephardics to the settlements, to the borders of Israel, because the confederacy that the Sephardim made has actually been turned on their head. They are actually the lower class as those Ashkenazi oppress them. This is what happens in the state of Israel today. All of the men of your confederacy have brought you even to the border. The men that were at shalom with you have deceived you and prevailed against you. They that eat your lechem, your bread, have laid an ambush under you. There is no knowledge in them. So leaders are deceiving one another because there is no honor 
among thieves. That's what this alliance brings forth. And you saw it back in the days with Arafat and Abbas, didn't you, in the West Bank. Their alliance, there's no honor among thieves. You've got the former prime minister of Israel. Where is he? Omar, he's in prison for corruption charges. Now, what are they trying to do with Netanyahu? There is no honor among thieves. You see, this is the whole thing. And now you see this coming forward into the reality. Leaders deceiving one another. Edom is involved in a theft and deception regarding Jacob Israel. And their theft and their deception will be turned back upon them because they've made this wicked confederacy. Look what it says in verse 7. I find that very interesting that they, Edom, if Edom are the Sephardic, what does it say about them? That they eat your bread. Who? Those that you've made an alliance with, the Ashkenazi, they eat your bread, the Sephardic. Just so happens, by the way, that the Ashkenazi eat $180 million worth of Sephardic baker's bread just from one bakery company in Israel a year. So yes, the Sephardic Jews actually do bake the bread for the Ashkenazi. Just one bakery produces $180 million worth of bakery goods for the Ashkenazi in a year. And that's on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. I'm not making this stuff up. So Yahweh literally brings you the very details to identify this stuff. Just to make sure that you are on track and that you're not what? inserting your own ideas into the text. Now, I'm extracting this out and actually basing it upon what I see in current events, and it is astounding to me. History, biblical culture, language, and context, and amazing things happen through prayer and the Holy Spirit. It's astounding to me. A confederacy with the Ashkenazi who have joined with Edom are using the Arabs... Remember the Valley of Arabah, which is the feminine for Arab. They are using the Arabs to bring about their end time intent for Jacob Israel. Do you remember the dancing Israelis on 9-11? Remember that? And the connection to Mossad? They're using the Arabs, the Muslims, to fester and bring about all of this hostility and destabilization of the nations to bring about their end time intent for their state of Israel. But Yahweh is going to bring forth what? The flame, Joseph, from the nations, and he's going to set fire to Israel to bring about his end time biblical people. It's amazing. It's amazing. Verse 8. Shall I not in that day, says Yahweh, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and Binah, understanding and knowledge, out of the Mount of Esau? And your mighty men, O Teman, they shall be dismayed to the end that everyone on the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Verse 10. Because of your Hamas... Hamas, violence, the Hebrew word there is Hamas. <laughs> That's kind of, you know, a little bit of a tell. Because of your Hamas against your brother, Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever and ever. So in verse 8, let's make the connections. Mount Esau equals Mount Seir. And from the Hebrew, the Hebrew word there is sagir, sagir, and it means goat. What are we talking about? Yeah, Mount Esau is Mount Seir. And that in the Hebrew connects us to sagir, which means goat or hairy goat. And the Greek translation of goat or hairy goat is actually diamenian, which comes across as demon. Which comes from the root, if you connect it all the way through, Edo, 
Edo, which means a knowing one, because that word connects to da'a, which comes from da'at, which means to have experimental knowledge. It's not the other Hebrew word, which is yada, which means intimate knowledge. No, this is experimental knowledge in demonology that connects all the way back to Esau and Edom. And James tells us in chapter 2, verse 19, that even the demons know and believe. They have da'at and believe. And this connects to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 17. They worship goat demons. This alliance is a confederacy with the Talmud. It's the worship of goat demons. This confederacy is an alliance with the Talmud and all of their occult writings to bring about what? their end time intent for unbiblical Israel. Edom can't expect to escape judgment when you take and occupy the mountains of Abraham. And that's what the Edomites have done. They have taken and they have occupied the mountains of Abraham and they've handed them over to become the mountains of Esau. These are the mountains of Abraham, and they've handed them over to become the mountains of Esau. And is there going to be judgment? Of course there's going to be judgment, specifically with East Jerusalem. And we're seeing a lot right now with Donald Trump saying, okay, I'm finally going to have the American embassy move to Jerusalem. Well, why? Well, why would they do that? I mean, for all of these years, finally... Because the globalists, including Trump, who knows what's going on, they know that they're about to what? The prophecy tells you, even in Zechariah, that they're going to what? Divide Jerusalem. They're going to make it an international city. And you think the Americans are going to miss out on an international city and have their embassy in Tel Aviv? Really? There's no way. This is what, where we're at. The division of Jerusalem, as it says in Zechariah. But I just want to backtrack a little bit. I hope you guys, are, some of you are looking at me crazy. Are you tracking with me? Or am I AWOL? Am I just too excited? All right, the tech room is with me. Okay, so that hopefully that means that you live streamers are with me. Because these guys here, I'm not sure. I got, to, I, got, I got the Marine one. I got the Marines with me. So I'm doing, I got the Marines. I got the tech room. Okay, I can do it. If I got the Marines with me, I'm feeling good. All right, let's continue on. In fact, let's go back with the thought of the Marines. Let's talk about somebody that was quite busy, and the Marines, you know, he wasn't in the Marines, but the Israeli equivalent, he was in the IDF. How about Moshe Dayan? Anybody know Moshe Dayan? The old, he had the eye patch. 1967, because look, we're at this portion in Scripture where Edom cannot expect to escape judgment when they occupy the mountains of Abraham and then they give the mountains of Abraham over to the Edomites. Well, who did that? Moshe Dayan in 1967, and you'll know why in a minute, Moshe Dayan was the Israeli defense minister. And what did he do in 1967 when they took Jerusalem? He shepherded the fleeing Edomites the ethnic Middle Easterners, back into King David's city. You see, Moshe Dayan became a shepherd for the Edomites. They were fleeing Jerusalem. And he gathered up the Edomites. And he, no, 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 come on back. No, no, come on, come on back up to the, up, up, up here above the Western Wall. No, 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 come on back. We'll hand it over to the waft. We'll hand it over to the Jordanians. No, no, we'll take the flag down, the Israeli flag down. No, no, no. He sh literally became a shepherd to the Edomites. Moshe, why, now, why would Moshe Dayan do that? Why would he do that? Well, you have to look into his history, and you have to understand. 
if the Edomites have made a confederacy with the Ashkenazi, then you better believe that when the shepherd comes, he's going to be a full shepherd. And now we can look at Moshe Diane, who shepherded the, the fleeing Edomites back into the city of the king. Israel bowed to pressure from its financiers and turned 80% of Hebron over to the Arabs. Thank you, Moshe Dayan, at that very moment. Moshe Dayan was none other than a Khazarian convert, an Ashkenazi. His parents were from the Khazarian settlement of Zashkiv in the Ukraine. And the Edomites, the Sephardim, had already made an alliance with them. Israel, in fact, the state of Israel is the father of Edom. Literally, in the biblical narrative, is Jacob the father of Edom. When we look and we follow it all the way back, Abraham is the father, and then we go down the line, and we have Jacob, and then we have Esau. And now we see this again happened in 1967. Israel fathered Edom, of which all subsequent Israeli leaders They've mastered this whole thing. Terrorism, the state of Israel, secularism, and every way they could, they have tried to emulate the carnality of Esau. The state of Israel isn't some biblical utopia. It is a culture of Edom, Carnal carnality, secularism, and everything that your body and carnal flesh can desire. In fact, Tel Aviv is the homosexual capital of Europe. The carnality of Edom is what the state of Israel is actually built upon, not the holy word of Yahweh. Theodore Herzl his Zionism basically used the Edomite Jew to bring into existence the Israeli state by making a way for all of the Ashkenazi and Edom's carnality and secularism. Today, the state of Israel is forever inclined and has a heart towards Edom. It's funded internationally because of its never-ending conflicts with the Arabs. And Edom has become the source of that very thinking and that very, very funding. Because Edom, the Sephardim, the Sephardic Jews, stole the identity of the real Jews. And then they made a confederacy partnership with the Ashkenazi, and the Ashkenazi stole their identity as Jews as well. This is exactly what Obadiah tells us will happen. There is no honor among thieves. Both the Sephardim and the Ashkenazi have stolen the identity of the Jews because the regal Negro house of Judah Left. These were the wealthy traveling merchant class that we covered in our video. It's available online, The Migration of Judah. They were the merchant wealthy class, and they, in exile, went down to West Africa and established the kingdom of Judah. But those that were poor that remained, they worked the land until they were forced to convert to Islam in the seventh century, because they could no longer afford to pay the Islamic jizya tax. And they became what we call today the Palestinians. Do you know how many Palestinian Christians there are? They've got that deep faith. Many of them are still believers, but they have had to convert literally for their life and because they didn't want to let go of their vineyards and their olive groves, because they could not afford the Islamic tax. So things are not always the way they see because Obadiah is what? Built upon lies and deception when it comes to Edom and their confederacy. So I hope thus far we've identified Edom as those that have stolen the identity of the Jews, moved in, then they make a confederacy with a more powerful group that moves in and then steals their identity as Jews and then actually enslaves them. 
That's the Ashkenazi and the Sephardim. And then the Sephardim are the ones that break, bake the bread for the Ashkenazi. And we see this in the scripture. Now we can go further forward and we'll see even more as this unravels. So the large majority of what the world calls Jews are actually of Eastern European descent today. They're mainly of Khazarian origin, Turkic Mongols. This reality means that their ancestors came not from Israel, but from the Volga. Not from Canaan, but from the Caucasus, once believed to be the cradle of the Indo-European. So genetically, they're actually closely, more closely related to Attila the Hun than our father Abraham. That's the reality. I mean, it's like, what a crazy world that we live in. The Khazars took the name of Ashkenaz because in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 27, Ashkenaz was prophesied to defeat Babylon. And who was it who came through in the first prophecy that they made an alliance with? The Babylonians. So they took the name Ashkenaz because Jeremiah 51, 27 tells us that Ashkenaz in that alliance is going to defeat the Babylonians. So they, of course, they took that name. So if the majority of Israelis aren't Jews, but the descendant of the Khazars, what about the remainder of the Jewish population there today? They are the Sephardim, or the Eastern Jew, the Edomite. And they've been in the land for many, many years because they are the real Edomites. Of course, Edomites are descendants of Jacob's twin Esau, or Edom. They've lived both sides of the um, Dead Sea and, of course, can constitute that Arab population for many, many centuries. So they're used to being in that land mass area, whereas the Ashkenazi aren't. They only came in at the end of the 19th century. So those Sephardim, those Edomites, they truly are descendants. If you connect it all the way back through Esau and Jacob, they are actually descendants of Shem. But these Jews are different from the Ashkenazi in appearance, way different, because they have darker skin. They look way more like the darker Middle Easterner, whereas um, you know, the Ashkenazi, of course, are a lot more European. The Sephardic, they compromise of about uh, 20% of the Israeli population. But the majority of Israel today are, in fact, Gentiles, because the Ashkenaz are Khazar Gentiles. They're from the Caucasian region. Does this make sense? And the history, of course, testifies to this. Let's get back into verse 9. And your mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that everyone of the Mount of Esau may be cut off for the slaughter. Verse 9, cut off of, in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word ketel. You can connect that to Daniel chapter 7, 11, where the beast was destroyed and given over to a burning flame, which connects us back to where? It connects us back into the prophecy here in Hosea. You're already there, aren't you? But Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 states, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And that's the sad thing. You and I, if we understand what's being communicated today, we truly are a remnant. Because the whole world is deceived, not only about how the true way to worship Yahweh is with his Sabbaths, his feasts, and his festivals. But they're also deceived as to who are the true Israelites and who are the true Jews. Total deception. Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 45 tells us that this word cut off, ketel in the Hebrew, speaks of kindling a fire and destroying where the blazing flame shall not be quenched. And it connects to our, um, Obadiah verse 18. So let's go to Obadiah verse 11, continuing on. 
in the day that you stood on the other side, in the day that the stranger carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered his gates, and they cast lots upon Jerusalem, even you, even you were as one of them. You see, Obadiah, he's calling it out. He speaks of a future fall and destruction of Edom. Edom's crime, of course, was being in participation in persecuting the people of Judah and in the destruction of Jerusalem. And of course, Teman was one of the sons of Esau, Edom. So these Sephardics, these Sephardim, these Edomites, these Eastern Jews that aren't really Jews, they stole the Jewish identity, are being oppressed today by those that they made the confederacy with, the Ashkenazi that also stole the Jewish identity because they've joined these Ashkenazi and they are in a confederacy with Sheol the synagogue of Satan. The surrounding Arab population despise them just as much as they do the Ashkenazi. So they've got it coming to them from both ways, the Sephardim, from both ways. But this is their punishment, according to Obadiah, to helping in the mistreatment of the true Jews, the true Israelites. The Sephardim, the Edomites, came into the land with the Romans and they laid their hand on Israel's possessions and pretended to be the Jews. But as Yahweh said, he would return the judgment upon their own head. So fast forward from the time of Titus to the beginning of the 20th century and the Sephardim make an alliance with the Ashkenazi and the Ashkenazi come in to the state of Israel and they move into that area which was Palestine at the time and now they're pretending to do the very same thing pretending of course to be the true Hebrews the true Israelites and the world is absolutely deceived, aren't they? Absolutely deceived. And Christian Zionist, Messianic, Hebrew roots, their whole eschatological worldview is based upon what? Believing the lie. And if you do this teaching, oh my goodness, they're going to charge you and start calling you names because it's the culture of shut up. That's what it is, right? If I call you a bad name... Because you're liberal and you're affected by appeasement, it's going to shut you down. doesn't work with me at all. Reverse just makes me louder. Because I'm not intimidated by that when you base things on scripture, history, culture, and context. Truth will stand. And no matter how much you try the culture of shut up, it will not work. And the world is waking up to it. Only the liberals that have no education shut up because they haven't got the facts to make the connections. They cannot connect to the next thought. They can only be in the present. We can connect to the next thought and then bring back into the history and bring it forward. And there you can stand because you stand on the biblical truth of Yahuwah's word. So again, we have to understand this book of Obadiah is powerful. I hope I'm not losing you here. So the Israelites, they descended from Jacob, while the Khazars descended from Japheth. And the Edomites, of course, from Esau. The Israelites originated from northeastern Africa, while the Khazars originated from southeastern Europe and the Edomites from the southern Palestinian or Jordanian area, the area of the Jordan, southern Jordan specifically. The majority of biblical Judah, I'm talking biblical Judah, have black skin according to the Bible with woolly hair and the Israelis today They have white skin, mostly blue eyes, long straight hair because they're from the Caucasus Mountains. I mean, wake up. I don't understand. They're Caucasians, Turkic Mongols. No connection at all to Shem. They're connected to Goma and Japheth. But, of course, 
this isn't politically correct. The Israelites spoke Egyptian, Hebrew, Aramaic, and later Greek, Roman, even Spanish, and various West African language, and today various languages of the Americas. The Israelis, the Khazars, they spoke a language called Yiddish, which many of them still speak. The Israelites practiced a faith of their forefathers commanded by Moshe through Yahuwah in the Torah. The Israelis practice a pagan philosophy called Judaism, which is connected to the goat demon, which we already spoke about, which is Mount Seir. So the Israelites, of course, by comparison, traveled by way of the Red Sea and the Jordan, while the Khazars traveled by way of the Caspian Sea and the Volga. I mean, there's such disparity that you would think by tracking the migration patterns out of Judea from the first century that you would come up with this stuff because it's all documented. The regal Negro class going down West Africa in the kingdom of Judah, it's all documented on 17th century maps of West Africa. And then the migration of the Turkic Mongols over into Western Europe, Ashkenaz area, and then coming down, of course, at the turn of the 19th century, followed, of course, with the triumphant glory of Theodore Herzl's invention of what we have today. And it's all documented in the history annals along with what we're talking here in the scriptures. So this, to me, is an amazing time because this is coming forth. These confederacies are being broken and exposed. The Israelites, of course, from Canaan through the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, while the Khazars come from the Caucasus through Goma, Togomar, and Khazar, the Edomites from Mount Seir through Abraham, Isaac, Esau, or Edom. Finally, according to the Bible, Yahuwah himself selected the Israelites and hated the Edomites. Malachi chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. While according to the history, Kazar was selected not by Yahuwah, but by the hands of man. It's huge. Edom, of course, means red. Edom and the Edomites joined forces with the Reds. Who are the Reds? The Ashkenazi, the Bolsheviks that led the world into the communist phase that finally we thought we were coming out of until it now landed upon our shores with today's modern political liberalism, which is communism. Why do you think at all of these political rallies you see the communist flag? It's been imported. Have you seen some of the the books and the authors that were on Obama's reading list? These were great, if there is such a thing, great communist leaders that our leaders had espoused up until our present president. Of course, the Bolsheviks had the 100-year plan. 1917, and now we're in 2018. We are at this very point. It was planned. It was the 100-year plan. They had 200 years in Russia, and now at the end of, um, what was it, 19... It was 1977, because they started off in Russia in, in 1777. 200 years in Russia fermenting, and then it opened up, and they exited Russia in around the 70s, late 70s, specifically the 80s. And where did these Khazars and Ashkenazis and Bolsheviks go? Israel accepted them all, of course, because this is all part of the Confederacy. Edom, of course, brought us into the communist phase, which is all designed to finally tear down Western society. And you and I wonder why we're coming up against all this this communism, which is enshrouded as liberalism. But you and I who know history, we know this is straight out of the communist um, manifesto. This is all part of the 100-year plan. And it's terrifying to me. You have to understand, when I was 11 years old, I didn't do much apart from being this boarding school And I have to play rugby, do cross-country runs, and smoke cigarettes, and then I hid in the library. And that's all I do. 
Because it was either that or be freezing cold. So my whole worldview was shaped based upon reading this stuff as a kid, forgetting about it during my secular years. And now, at my age now, I've got access to this stuff, not only online, and I, it's all coming back. And I'm like, wow, who would have thought the stuff that I read when I was a kid and I was just causing trouble and you know, trying to, you know, play hooky and whatnot in the library and stay warm near the radiators. And I'd spend hours reading. Now it set me up for where we're at. It's just astounding to me. Edom's judgment comes about because it chose to join forces with the Ashkenazi. Ashkenaz can be traced to the Westward migration and infiltration of Russia, the communist phase, and of course, what did the Russians, the Bolsheviks do? They decided to push westward, and the only country that would stand up to them was what? Germany. Germany was the only country that would stand up to the sons of Ashkenaz, and of course, then they were infiltrated by the Ashkenazi. Of course, Germany had the highest concentration of Ashkenazi outside of Russia, and it was being destroyed from within by the Ashkenazi bankers during the Versailles period after the World War I. The Ashkenazi they took over Russia and the USSR, and they played the role of the heathen nations pushing westward. The USSR or Russia pushing westward. The, Ashken the Ashkenazi press back in the 1940s, they actually, late 30s, they stirred up an uproar in Western Europe, which justified what? the eventual allied invasion and destruction of Europe. And we live in a post-allied world, and people forget that. We live in a post-allied world, and we are the products, our politics are the products of that time. And people forget that. The Ashkenazi, of, of course, took over Russia and brought about the destruction of Western Europe. In verse 11 can also refer, I believe, to the future attempted international partition of Jerusalem, which I think has now been set in motion. And if you're going to partition Jerusalem, it makes sense that the Americans would move their embassy there, right? You don't want to be in an international city and be stuck with your embassy in Tel Aviv. Now's the time to move if you're going to. Verse 12, but you should not have looked for the day of your brother's disaster, whether it was with the Babylonians, whether it was with the Romans, or whether it was the destruction of the Western nations with the Allied invasion and the apocalypse that came with World War II. In the day that you became a stranger, neither should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither should you have spoken proudly in the day of their distress. And of course, this speaks of the two exiles. Number one, when the ten tribes were exiled. And number two, when Jewish Israel was put under the heel of the Romans and exiled. So these ethnic Middle Easterners, they aided the Romans and then later the Mohammedans, and they took the identity of the Jews, becoming known as the Sephardim, the true Edomites, that then made an alliance with Theodore Herzl's Ashkenazi. They baked the bread for the Ashkenazi, and now this confederacy is cracking, it's being exposed, and we're seeing it being exposed in Brexit, in Wall Street, with the Saudis, because the Ashkenazi are involved with the Saudis, with the Wall Street bankers, with the Bank of England, and it is all starting to fracture because they made this confederacy, the Sephardic, the, with the Gentiles, the Ashkenazi, who've in turn taken the identity of Israel. And we know that Zechariah tells us that Jerusalem is going to become what? It's going to become a cup of stumbling and a cup of drunkenness. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 2. Zechariah 
was one of the, the contemporaries around the time after they had returned from Babylon, so it was later than Obadiah, Zechariah came into the time. He was a prophet around the time of the Hasmonean dynasty. So it's a little bit later, but before the Roman allegiance that the Edomites made. So he's in that middle ground between the droves. Does that make sense? And Zechariah tells us that there's going to be two-thirds in this Zionistic state of Israel that are going to be what? Two-thirds are going to be destroyed, and one-third is going to remain. One-third are going to remain, and how are they going to remain? The Scripture tells us that they will remain, the one-third will remain through fire. Who's fire? What does, it say in e what does it say in Obadiah? Israel. They will remain through Israel. There will be a third that will remain in Israel. That's the fire. And at that time, then saviors, it says, will come from the nations. And if they will be called the flame. That's the last division of Rachel's son, Joseph, biblical Israel, coming back. Because who has the name of Israel upon them? Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph. This is all where we're at in current events. Zechariah 14 verse 3 tells us that Jerusalem's going to be divided. I believe we're going to see that division into an international city. That's why I think that the embassy has been planned on being moved there. Now, I don't have time. We'll go into um, chapter, not chapter, but part two of Obadiah next week. I hope you kind of track with me because truly, I just felt, I'm going to take a couple of weeks off, do something a little light, not too heavy, and, 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 and here we go. But, you know, it's exciting. Questions, comments, Marine One in the back. Put that microphone, eat it. Okay. We do have the, all the audio, and we do have the video as well to probably such a certain degree, but we will have that up this week, so I want to let her. So that know means that, that Corey's going to be really Correct. busy, Ashley, so but pray for him. We have He's going to be syncing and doing all of that fabulous technical stuff, so audience, pray for Corey and Jonathan, our tech team. We do have some questions. Uh, number one, who are the true Jews then, Matthew, and where are they? Well, we, um, I would point you to our um, YouTube um, video collection, and we have a teaching called the Migration of Judah. But in quick summation, the regal Negroes, which was the royal house of Judah, the merchant class, the wealthy class, were exiled and went to the kingdom of Judah in West Africa after the Roman destruction of the temple under Titus, leaving the poor migrant class in the land, which were olive workers, vineyard workers, and they were the um, land migrant Jews that stayed in the land and still currently in the land. But during the seventh century, when the Mohammedans came, they were forced to either convert to Islam, pay the jizya tax. They could not afford the jizya tax, so they were going to lose their land. They were connected to the land, so they converted many to Islam. And when the founders of the state of Israel, um, David Ben-Gurion, who was the first prime minister, he was a historian before he was prime minister, and the first president, um, oh, what was his name? Zavi, Ben Zavi, I believe, may be wrong on that, but they were both historians. When they came into the land at the turn of the 20th century, they admitted as historians, that the Palestinian Arabs that were actually in the land were the Fehalim, the Jews, the migrant worker class that had remained since the time of the Romans. It was only after the massacre in Hebron in 22 that 
the national narrative in Israel changed and they became Palestinians. But before that, historically, they admitted, no, they're actually the real Jews. And they were going to actually bring them into the fold. But after the massacre in Hebron, they decided, no way, the, the culture wouldn't accept that. And this, this um, division and wedge came. I believe that can be studied in a book and on my reading list by Shlomo Sand, which is an Israeli Jew that actually brings forth that history. So that's an Israeli Jew that's telling you that based upon facts, not, again, the culture of shut up, which would say, oh, don't talk about that. So again, it's either historical truth or, again, we see today that people have this tendency just to kind of make it up. Yes. I believe you uh, touched on this, but there was a question on um, who makes up the tribes of Ephraim. Ephraim. Ephraim is the ten tribes that were scattered to the nations under the Assyrians and have been dispersed into the nations. Many people will say, of course, if you, I think the best person who's going to give you all the information on that is not going to be Matthew Nolan, but actually a gentleman called Stephen Collins. And he actually does um, a great, great work on the migration of the ten tribes to um, Western Europe and the Americas and the other nations, so even down into India. Is Obadiah completely fulfilled or partially fulfilled? Is Obadiah complete? Well, like I said, it's based upon the text in Genesis chapter 32, the way that I'm understanding it, and I don't have all the insight, you know, many we come together, is I believe it is a multi-layer prophecy with three wheels, a wheel within a wheel within a wheel, your first, second, and third cycle. I believe we're in that third cycle now where the confederacies are being exposed, those Ashkenazi alliances with the Saudis, with the European Union. It's all coming undone, whether it's Brexit, the, the, the breakup that we've had with the Saudis and the exposure over there in the past month, and what's happening here. I mean, they're trying to take out Trump because he's not part of their globalist Ashkenazi bought system. Some would say he is with his son-in-law. Uh, again, you know, there's an infiltration on all parts. It's, it, it's a crazy times that we live in, but I'm just thankful that we can go to the Word and through prayer and supplication know that we are not alone and that we can have answers when you know the liberals are going to literally serve you up CNN and insanity. So, yes, question. A few years ago, I led a group of people to the, to, to the land of Israel. Yes. And when we got to Tel Aviv, we were met by 250,000 gay pride people. I was asked by the leader of the church there in um, Jefferson, what did you think, Don, of your trip to Jerusalem? My comment was, there are a lot of unholy people in the Holy Land. Yeah, exactly because of these confederacies and alliances. And you have to understand the root of Zionism is atheism. I mean, Theodore Herzl was not a follower of Yahuwah, and neither were the um, founders of the state of Israel. I mean, it's, it's founded upon, again, the occult and this, this, this alliance that has been exposed that Obadiah talks about. Anybody else? Oh. All right. Abba, we thank you, Abba, and we pray that, Abba, you will bring forth more revelation as, Abba, we jump into the latter verses of Obadiah next week, Abba, and that you would shake down and press forward, Abba, the things that have been said today, and that, Abba, that needs to fall by the wayside would fall by the wayside, but you would increase that, Abba, of your revelation and truth in these days. We thank you, Abba, for the prophet Obadiah. We thank you for your holy word, that, Abba, the, the whole of your scriptures, from Genesis to Revelation, is for us today. It is for it is the Holy Scripture for reproof and for learning and understanding. We thank you in Yahusha's mighty name. Amen.